bring it to? Who is the first speaker? The second speaker? And the third? Convention on Migrants' Rights. Today we see that we need immediate ratification uh, is necessary uh, because we have increasing uh, numbers of immigrants because of the globalization process in our world that leads to different cultures and different uh, religious view, uh, people uh, in one country. And uh, we see uh, inequality between those uh, people as we prioritize, prioritize uh, only uh, our citizens and forgot about uh, immigrants that uh, are uh, uh, that have to be uh, equal also. United, uh, this uh, Convention uh, of, uh, of Immigrants' Rights protects basic human rights, right to religion, uh, right to equal opportunities, right to join labor unions, right, uh, right to access uh, education for immigrants and their children, right to family reunion, and right to health care. We see that uh, right now uh, they don't have these rights, and that's the, uh, the, that's the biggest problem, ladies and gentlemen. So today I will prove you with uh, two main uh, arguments why we need this ratification. Firstly, uh, I will talk about moral obligation, and secondly, I will show the benefits that will come, and I will talk about social and economic benefits. So going to my first argument, ladies and gentlemen, about moral obligation. We see that uh, these immigrants do not have those rights right now. And it's actually the biggest problem because countries in their constitutions agree agrees on personal happiness and on universal human rights. Uh, they do protect uh, and propose those rights, but actually uh, they don't, uh, we, we see that they put double standards as they only propose those rights to their citizens, but not to the, uh, not to the immigrants who live in that country. And Actually, firstly, they did in that country, and secondly, we see that they contribute the economy of that country. As in the United Kingdom, uh, immigrants uh, contribute 10.2% uh, 10, 10 of all taxes, and they bring benefits to the country. Even though if they bring benefits, countries still put double standards and undermine their uh, rights and opportunities. So we see hypocrisy here, ladies and gentlemen, because firstly, those countries propose human rights. They try to help uh, for people in other countries as they give a refugee status or, for, or give aid to uh, people in other countries, but they don't care about those who are in their state. And this creates an unfairness in the society, ladies and gentlemen. We see that this convention will solve this unfairness problem and will protect uh, those immigrants. So talking about the second argument, ladies and gentlemen, we see benefits. Firstly, we see social benefits. With the right to education, we will have an investment to the future generations because uh, those uh, immigrants' children will be able to get uh, to go to schools and we will have more qualified specialists in our country. Uh, also, uh, it, uh, they, have, they will have ability to learn because usually they come from developing countries that do not protect their uh, uh, their uh, education and they do not have the right to learn in there. And uh, thirdly, we see that those immigrants who are currently working will be able to raise their qualifications and get uh, a better job. Secondly, uh, this education will lead to uh, integration because right now we have tensions between and these tensions are caused this because of dissatisfaction of the government as government undermine their rights and also because of the cultural differences. So firstly, we, when we will uh, protect those rights with this convention, the, this, that's, we will remove the satisfaction against the government that causes tensions as for example in 2005 in uh, immigrants in France. And secondly, uh, uh, we will, uh, uh, the, we will uh, remove uh, f f tensions in future because those children will learn uh, uh, in the schools about the history, about the culture, about the values, and they will be more similar to the culture uh, where they live in. And this will uh, uh, help to integrate and will diminish tensions in the, f uh, in the present and in future. And secondly, we see 
ladies and gentlemen, that the, uh, uh, this convention will bring economic profits. Because actually, the reason why immigrants come to our country is that they do uh, is because of economic reasons. They are eager to work. They are eager to get at, uh, more uh, money as as much money as they can. And ladies and gentlemen, actually, when we ensure these rights, uh, their working rights, with uh, their right to labor unions, their education, and their health insurance, they will uh, we will have more productive workers because they will have nothing to worry about, and they will be able to. Uh, and they will be able to uh, uh, work and produce better goods in our society. So ladies and gentlemen, what I proved you today with my speech is that uh, firstly, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, immigrants uh, that are actually a, big, a huge problem in our society. And we have differences between immigrants and dissatisfaction that comes from them. So we, uh, this United Nations Convention protects the basic human rights, the rights to education and religion and uh, uh, health insurance, education, that actually they want to have. And this will be, and this is what uh, they need. So this is firstly morally right, and secondly, it will bring us uh, benefits. I beg you to propose. <laughs> with this convention doesn't uh, doesn't exist. Well, what if? Just, you know, imagine what if this would happen. What happens if providing outsiders with rights conflicts with, with our citizens? There is no what if. There is no what if. So there's no situation which has ever happened. I'm going to ask you to just play a pretend game with me for a minute. Imagine that this could possibly happen. If we show you that this, that providing these people with rights will infringe upon the rights of the nation's citizens, is that reason to negate? We see that uh, even if uh, that harms citizens, the situation that is actually right now uh, is more harmful than uh, after this ratification. Of the so basically, the situation that's going on right now, which is that migrants don't have every, don't have all the same rights as citizens, is a worse situation than actually taking away rights from citizens, taking away protections. From uh, citizens. The convention doesn't take away uh, rights from citizens. I know. I'm asking you to imagine that in a in a world where some where giving rights to somebody else would take away. Okay, let's let's use an example, right? There's a, a government only has a certain amount of money, right? Funds aren't unlimited, right? Yes. Okay, so obviously if the government decides to allocate a lot of funds towards something new, like giving all these migrants, for example, you know, education, uh, extra education, extra tutorial systems, this could potentially take away money for education for citizens, correct? Mm -hmm. 
fact is that uh, these immigrants uh, work, and uh, when they work, they uh, pay taxes, and uh, money uh, that government will use for that education will be from their taxes. Okay, so you're saying that this 10.2% or whatever it is is going to be enough money to create all these new programs that the convention suggests. Actually, we have statistics that, uh, and uh, our second speaker will talk that the average of uh, uh, that um, immigrant uh, pay at taxes is uh, more than the average that citizens pay uh, in taxes. Okay, so essentially you're telling me, okay, just just one more question. What are, are you suggesting that we give rights to both legal immigrants and illegal, correct? Uh, we give uh, the that, that convention uh, basically talks about legal immigrants, and uh, I believe the beginning of the. Con oh. Thank you to our opponents for their first speech, and thank you to the judges for watching this round. Essentially, when we're answering today's resolution, there are three key questions that we need to answer. The first question is, what exactly is the moral obligation of governments to other citizens, and does this moral obligation actually exist? If it does, how far does it extend? The second question we need to answer is, what happens if the rights of the migrants and the rights of the original citizens conflict? If there is a scenario, how does the government prioritize rights? Now the opposition says this scenario can never occur, but if the negative manages to demonstrate that this conflict actually does happen and that the government ought to prioritize its own people, that means you must reject the affirmative case. The third and final question we need to answer is, what exactly happens to the countries where all the migrants are leaving? Do those countries benefit from, the, uh, from ratifying the convention? And if so, how do they benefit? And if not, how are they harmed? So let's answer the first question. The affirmative's first contention is that there is a moral obligation to promote equality and that currently migrants and citizens don't have the same rights. However, the, this brings us to our first negative argument, which is that there are already international agreements that protect the basic fundamental rights that all people enjoy, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which are generally universal. 
Instead of increasing the economic and social rights of migrants, all states should recognize that every human being is entitled to certain rights simply because they're human. The European Commission and the European Platform for Migrant Workers' Rights conducted a study of European government's positions on the convention in December of 2010. Uh, of 2010, and they found that only 24 out of 20, they, uh, they found that 24 out of 27 countries all mentioned that these rights are protected by international and national legislation that already exists. So the point is this convention is superfluous and it shouldn't be ratified because these rights are already protected. Governments do not have an overarching obligation to provide rights beyond the basic fundamental human rights. This is because citizens give up liberties to the government in exchange for protection, meaning the government's first and foremost obligation is to their own people. As long as governments protect basic human rights, they are fulfilling their duties. Remember, the resolution talks about migrants, which includes legal and illegal immigrants. Affirming forces governments to proactively give economic and social privileges to all of these people, which is an unnecessary and unfair burden upon governments. For example, Article 44 requires that all states unify migrant families and use their resources to bring their families together. Article 45, Clause 3 mandates that states must teach the mother tongue and language of all migrants. These are unnecessary privileges that states should not have to give to migrants who do not deserve the exact same benefits as citizens. So remember, their first intention says, for example, that these immigrants pay certain taxes. However, the problem is that when we have even more immigrants coming to the countries, they're going to be stealing jobs away. For example, the U.S. Census Bureau conducted a study and reports that 40 to 50 percent of wage loss among low-skilled Americans is due to competition from immigrants who are unskilled workers. Almost 2 million American workers are displaced from their jobs every year by immigration. So if we're talking about taxes, the fact is these new immigrants are going to be paid lower wages because they're willing to work for less. So overall, taxes are going to decrease at the end of the day. So if we're talking about the benefits that happen to the host country, the problem is that these benefits are going to disappear if we affirm. Now let's answer the second question is what happens when rights conflict? So particular parts of the convention violate domestic laws and states should not be forced to ratify a convention that cannot be reconciled with policies they view as necessary. For example, not a single member of the EU has ratified the convention and the study that I mentioned before has reported. For the Minister of Polish legislation of special rights to illegal migrants in Poland may act as a stimulus for illegal migration and increase the number of people residing without permits. This would be detrimental to the Polish state as well as migrants themselves. More, it would also be inconsistent with the EU's migration policy, which implies opposition to illegal migration and the selective admission of legal migrants. So what this is demonstrating is that there is a conflict between domestic law there's a, and international law. There's a conflict between what a government deems to be necessary to protect its own people and this convention, which means that domestic law should trump international law. The report continues to describe Lithuania's own situation and says, the Lithuanian Migration Department replied that Lithuania will not ratify the convention because A, the rights of migrant workers and their family members are already protected by international conventions, B, some provisions mentioned in the convention uh, contradict the national law, and C, the implementation of some provisions would require additional financial resources which would put a burden on Lithuania that it cannot uphold because it does not allow countries to choose the measures that, uh, by which they implement the convention. So this report lists the 27 countries of the EU and thoroughly demonstrates that the convention compromises national law to a point where the two cannot both coexist and flourish because they impose impossible burdens on countries. Now the affirmative is going to try to demonstrate that they only want to protect basic rights. The problem is that if you look closely at the convention, it forces governments to protect rights beyond those basic rights. It forces governments to give social and economic privileges that only citizens should enjoy. Now let's go to their second argument, which says there are social benefits. They talk about how there are going to be fewer tensions. However, you can turn this argument against them. It's actually going to be even worse if we give these migrants rights. I've already demonstrated to you that there's this tension. For example, in the US, there's lots of antagonism towards Mexican immigrants because we see them as competition. Letting these immigrants flood in even more is going to create more social unrest. Now let's answer the third question, which is what are these bad effects? I've already mentioned the tension. But the next argument is that there's going to be a brain drain. The BBC News explains that countries like Malawi, it is estimated that there are only two doctors for every 100,000 people. There's a critical shortage of workers specifically because they leave for other countries. So if we ratify the convention, that means that we're encouraging this migration, which means that these developing nations are never going to pull themselves out of poverty, meaning that we need to make sure that we encourage domestic law, which doesn't happen in the Ukraine. Thus, we need to take this.
And a few questions. Sure. Well, what you told about in your speech many times is about, is about that, influ uh, that, that more migrants will come to the country. Why is so? So the idea is that there are going to be increased rights that they get. The convention very clearly said that we're going to be giving them tons of social and economic privileges. This means that there are going to be fewer barriers to migrants moving to these countries and settling in, which necessarily provides an incentive, right? Thank you, madam. But uh, isn't, isn't flows, are, are flows unrestricted in the country? No, the argument is not that the flows are unrestricted, but rather that we are essentially giving them tons of rights that they don't deserve, but right? Madam, We're giving them tons of privileges. Thank you, madam. Sure. But do we, uh, that, did we say that we're, that we're gonna open, op, or we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna leave open borders in, uh, in those countries? The argument is still true, even if borders are not totally open, right? The but argument is that if there are huge incentives to migrate and we don't try to limit the privileges that they get, there's absolutely no reason for people to not try to migrate uh, but, illegally. But madam, the number of visas that we give and the legal and legal opportunities to come are not are not uh, unlimited. We have a, 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 some sure. number. In a perfect scenario, we would be able to choose exactly how many immigrants come. The problem is that historically, that's just not true, right? Look at the U.S. We try to restrict immigration, but the problem is there are still tons of immigrants who are coming in illegally anyway. So making arguments about how we can close borders doesn't actually solve the problem because that's exactly what we're trying to do in the status quo, and it doesn't work. Thank you. And you, you talk about it, uh, you talk about uh, um, unnecessary rights and about education. Can you please expand the idea why education for immigrant children is not unnecessary? Sure, that's not my argument. If you look closely at Article 45, it specifically says that nations, receiving nations of migrants, have to educate migrants in their mother tongue and their mother culture. So that means if I come from a really small country, let's say Southeast Asia, and I move to the US, when I go to public education, they have to teach me my home language and they have to teach me my home culture, right? My argument is that, for example, Lithuania says that the problem they have with the convention is that it says that they have to do certain things in certain ways and that is a violation of sovereignty. So it's not that we have a problem with education, right? It's a problem with the way the convention sets out those terms. Thank you, madam. Isn't it, uh, isn't it hypocritical that we now contribute, many, we have contributed to our economy so much from these migrants that we do not give those rights that would actually be beneficial for both sides? Well, in the negative world, we're still giving them basic protections, right? We're not denying them, we're not abusing them and denying them basic rights. We're still giving them the tools for them to flourish. The idea is the government doesn't have an obligation to ratify a convention that gives them privileges that only citizens should deserve. So, uh,
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the two biggest flaw, uh, flaws of uh, team negative is, first of all, that they, uh, uh, that they do not understand that we are only talking about the uh, increase of rights for legal immigrants, not about uh, illegal ones. And, uh, and the second flaw is that uh, the, the flows of immigrants that we have in our countries are controlled by our, our own government policies. And you know, they actually never presented any kind of statistics or any kind of analysis why this flow should increase. And you know, uh, they said that all the illegal immigration might uh, increase. But what we know uh, uh, that from 2009 to 2010, uh, due to intensive border control in European Union, the illegal flows decreased by almost 10 percent. So we believe that those. Uh, th those borders can be uh, restricted and those flaws, flaws uh, would not be some kind of incentivized. Okay, uh, talking about the uh, first uh, point about that international uh, treaties already uh, somehow protect those rights, but what we believe that this treaty is more superior because it ensures the exact rights for immigrants and will have United Nations uh, United Nations, uh, you know, uh, structural um, uh, st structures that will uh, that will care for those exactly for those immigrants, and also that this treaty ensures um, more rights, such as you know, uh, a better access to education that we do not have uh, in the treaties that we have right now, and uh, uh, access to tra uh, labor unions that are essential for uh, immigrants. Okay, um, Okay, and then they talk about that there's only obligation to their own citizens. But ladies and gentlemen, so their point was that, you know, citizens, uh, government is obliged to the citizens because the citizens follow the laws of, of the government. But ladies and gentlemen, look, the, the government, the first of all, it decides to allow immigrants to come. So first of all, it shows the willingness to cooperate with that immigrant because of allowing allowing him to come by giving a visa. And then the immigrant, just as a citizen, has to follow laws. Uh, uh, so we believe that uh, because of this mutual consensus, uh, immigrant, immigrants also should also be uh, also have the rights that uh, uh, natives, natives can have. Uh, and their, their whole point of to know that uh, it, uh, the illegal immigration might, you know, somehow we're giving uh, better, uh, more rights to illegal immigrants is relative because the only right that we are giving is a more humane uh, deportation that we have, for example, in, in France in 2010, uh, where people were forced to leave uh, um, exactly uh, by not giving their time to prepare for the deportation. We would ensure that deportation is more humane, that we would not give any kind of more rights. Uh, Okay, uh, then they never talked about uh, any, uh, any kind of our, uh, they never said to our educational point about the how immigrants would actually, uh, uh, how their uh, how immigrants would have better education, uh, access to education, and their perception of the culture uh, and, and the, the nation that they are would improve, and therefore the tensions would uh, decrease. Okay. Uh, and they're uh, talking about uh, talking about uh, the economic uh, economic be uh, benefits. Uh, so their so their point was, you know, that this is bad only because we have uh, an increased flow of immigrants. This is not true because, as what we told you, the government can't control uh, the flow of immigrants. And uh, what else we know that the contribution that immigrants uh, do is actually very huge because in UK immigrants pay. 2.5 billion taxes more than they take in social guarantees. So we believe that because of this, uh, this contribution to our societies, a more, uh, more, uh, there's an economic benefit and also a moral obligation for us exists. Um, also, when they talk about the unemployment rates, what we believe that the unemployment rates that exist are usually in a high school jobs. But, uh, but uh, what we know that immigrants are usually low school jobs, 30% of them uh, uh, do, uh, only have high school education. So we believe uh, that there is a lack of the cheap labor force, and the cheap labor force uh, uh, is filled by, uh, by uh, those immigrants, and the employment that exists is, uh, is from uh, high school workers. Uh, 
And also, they never refuted our point about uh, this economic benefit that, uh, because when you have your rights uh, increased, when you're safer about your future, when you can join uh, labor unions that care for your uh, that care for your rights, you have a, a better, uh, you know, you are, um, are uh, you can be less concerned about your future because you know that your rights are ensured, and that produces uh, in better productivity of uh, of an immigrant, and we believe that. When we have better productivity, it's beneficial for both. Uh, the immigrant who can contribute, uh, who can work better, contribute more taxes, and also uh, better for the state that can get more uh, more taxes. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we showed you today that those uh, those flaws uh, that uh, that there will be an increase of immigrants because we have uh, we have border control and what we showed you that the immigrants that there are uh, that we have uh, right now are contributing to our society so we believe that because they are contributing they have the right uh, uh, for the rights to be protected therefore I beg you to propose the motion thank you Protecting the rights of, let's say, migrants would somehow detract from the government's ability to protect the privileges of its own citizens. How does the government prioritize those rights versus privileges? Well, we believe that in this situation, because immigrants have, have the obligation to follow the government's laws, and because the government, first of all, showed, showed its willingness to cooperate with the, with the immigrant because it allowed it to come uh, in the, uh, to the country, we believe that it should, should care for both. Uh, okay, when so even they, sure. when, Okay, just in a second. When the immigrant actually contributes to the, uh, when the immigrants contribute right, to society. I understand, society. they contribute yeah. to society. So if a government lets in a migrant, does that automatically mean that the government is obligated to give them endless privileges? Well, Where we does the government's obligation stop? We are not talking about endless privileges. We are talking about privileges that would increase the rights that those immigrants deserve. So let's talk about one of the examples I brought up in my last speech. Right, Article 45 of the Convention clearly says that governments must teach the mother tongue of all migrants to those migrants. Is that a fundamental right that they're entitled to, that the government must protect because they contribute to society? We, be, we believe that this right should be, uh, should be um, it should be, uh, should be uh, allowed for those immigrants because... Sure, so let's say I'm an immigrant, right? And let's say I speak Farsi or something, right? And I'm not really good at my language, but I go to public school and you know, the convention says the state has an obligation to promote my mother tongue. Does that mean that they have to find me a teacher who teaches me Farsi and my local culture? Yes, because that would be beneficial for the government because the tensions that we have right now because, you know, uh, not, not have a clear understanding of the culture because okay, of having, great. you know, language differences, that causes tensions that we Sounds see in good. our society. So, the last argument that I make in my speech is that uh, these professionals are leaving countries like Malawi and many other African countries to seek these privileges that are provided in developed nations. So what happens to these developing nations well, in the uh, in the? We believe that those those many of those nations you know have already ratified the convention. So we believe that they have already agreed on the uh, on 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 the so on the principles that that exist. And also we uh, what we talked about that the flows to, uh, are are controlled. So there won't be some kind of uh, of rush to those uh, Western countries. Sure. Even if there's not a rush, it seems to be that the people who do move are all the skilled and professional people. All, let's say the doctors in Africa are all moving out of Africa. That's been historically proved. So what happens to those developing countries? How do they have any people left to actually protect their own citizens? Well, that's not true that all, you know, that, uh, that all the skilled labor leaves those There are two doctors for every 100,000 people in the law. They're leaving for other countries. Okay, How does that empirically fall? Okay, but, um, should I answer? Or not? You can answer. Okay, what we see that, first of all, those nations have already ratified the convention, and also that from the percent, that only 30% of immigrants are high skilled, uh, are the, the high skilled labor does not leave uh, those countries. Great, thank you. Thank you.
First, I'd like to go over the flaws that our opponents try to point out in our case. First of all, they say that we're only talking about legal migrants. However, in the convention itself, Articles 8 through 35, 35 being the deeming clause saying that we're not talking about just legal migrants, state clearly that we're talking about illegal migrants and giving them the benefits in those clauses. So empirically, that's just denied, and we have a copy of the actual convention if you'd like to see it to prove that. However, they also go on to say that there's no reason there will be a pull factor. There's no reason that the immigration will increase. Well, legally in the convention, it says, yes, states can prevent the actual immigration, but illegal immigrants are a different story. Illegal immigrants don't come in through the naturalization, uh, the natural process that countries present. This means that if there are any more pull factors want, making people want to go into these countries, they're going to start coming into the countries. So as we show, 8 through 35 give these illegal immigrants rights that are not enumerated in like normal conventions, which means that they're getting unfair rights because they are legal immigrants. They, again, do not protect the legal immigrants in any of their arguments. These people will want to come into the country. And because they want to come into the country, they're going to try to. They say that, well, you, uh, the EU has already been successful at stopping it. But when you have more people wanting to come in, you're going to need more police trying to stop them, which means you're putting an unfair burden on these countries to use up their resources to try to stop illegals because of an unfair pull factor. So moving on to the actual distinction between citizens and migrants. So we say that citizens are given certain rights because they are in fact citizens, and that when rights are given to migrants and citizens, there's a certain balance between them. So when migrants start getting more rights and those rights infringe on the rights of citizens, that's a bad thing because citizens are the first and prior concern of governments. Governments are formed to protect citizens, not, for, not to protect migrants migrants of the world. So once we look to citizens first, we can look at what migrants are getting and whether they deserve it. So first of all, they say that migrants should deserve these rights because they have economic benefits. But if migrants are being paid less empirically and are also taking the jobs of citizens, and we have a stat, for example, in the US, 1.1 million migrants as well, uh, 1.1 million migrants and 700 illegal migrants are coming into the US, costing the US $15 billion in the necessary social welfare to pay for their own employees not having jobs anymore. These immigrants are going to be taking the lower wage jobs of these, of these uh, citizens and being paid less. So because these migrants are being paid less, their income taxes, which make up a significant portion of the actual taxes that are funding these economies, are going to be significantly lower. Because the income tax is lower, you might have 10%, but if that 10% of the taxes is now a lower number, 10% is no longer significant. Because you're gonna have, instead of you know five out of $50, only two out of $20. So that's clearly a still decrease, even though they try to give percentages to skew it to make it look better. Now let's move on to what illegal migrants would do. Illegal immigrants coming to the country don't even pay income tax. They're not gonna be paying the same taxes. Sure, they're going to buy and sell things, but the simple taxes on the food that they can afford is not the same as the taxes that they're going to have to pay if they were documented workers. And again, we give you reasons as to why there's a pull factor and why more illegal immigrants will exist. So let's move on to why you shouldn't ratify the convention. And Lithuania put it very succinctly in defining three key points. First of all, these conventions already exist. Human rights are already protected in the world. We've mentioned the actual conventions themselves, and they say, well, that's all we really need to give to migrants. In their own speech, they say we should protect human rights. What the convention does, however, is go a step beyond that. And those, those protections are not necessarily human rights. For example, in Clause 45, they say that they need to be educated in their own mother tongue, as well as provide social housing, which is the government paying for the housing of these migrants simply because they immigrated to the country. And then, uh, actually in Article 44, they also say that you need to have uh, family unification, which can again pose problems into the unfair burden on these countries because they need to reunite the families of migrants, meaning they need to accept everyone in their family just because someone's able to contribute to society. Again, going against their contribution point. If you have one person working and the convention says you have to bring in their entire family, the little kids are not gonna be able to contribute to society, but they are gonna be using up education resources, which means again, they're not contributing and they're getting the benefits that they don't deserve. So let's move on to the second point, saying that it conflicts the actual laws of these nations. As we've shown in Lithuania, as well as in other countries such as in Poland, the actual uh, legislation conflicts greatly with the um, legislation of the country. We actually have a list of countries that in the study that we presented earlier have this conflict. Greece, Ireland, Italy, Poland, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, and the UK, all in the EU, EU upon uh, also uh, Lithuania, are the ones that have actual legal differences, meaning they'd have to change their own laws, which infringes on the sovereignty of these nations and clearly is not a justified solution. And moving on to the third point, which is that there's an undue burden. Again, we mentioned the rights that are given, uh, the privileges that are given in the convention, and we say that the rights that are required, as our opponents are suggesting, so 
such as human rights, the right to life, the right to water, the right to protection of your own body, are already enumerated. But the unfair burdens on these economies are significantly worse. So not only are you getting more migrants taking up the jobs of citizens, which need to have the actual rights, you know, need to have social welfare because their jobs are no longer there, the country needs to help them out, they're also giving more rights to migrants. So clearly the burden is exponentially larger than what is clearly than what is naturally seen by just reading the convention and seeing that you need to be educated in your mother tongue, which in the US, for example, has hundreds and maybe even thousands of nationalities with different languages coming into the country, meaning they need to spend resources learning how to teach all different, very obscure languages, which is going to be literally impossible. Well, not literally impossible, but you know, in most cases, very, very hard to do. So once we have all of these distinctions as to why we shouldn't ratify it, we can move on to the brain drain argument, which is why universally there's sort of a disparity caused by migrants moving from one country to another. So the most educated are the ones most, most likely to move, and these migrants are the ones that are going to be using up the resources in these countries, but they're also the ones that could have contributed to their own nation nationalities. And these people are not going to be the ones that are going back to their countries. They're going to all reside in countries that are, you know, the ones most capable already. So these people are going to be wasting their, wasting their talents in different countries countries, right? The U.S., for example, has enough resources. We don't need that many more immigrants. But if you take people that are in poor countries moving to the U.S., you're going to have massive disparity between nations, which is clearly a harm to the entirety of society, not just the nation itself or the migrant itself. So as we've shown, the rights are already enumerated, the rights are already protected, but once migrants start getting more of these, there's more of a pull factor, and this pull factor only has exponential harm. Thank you for your time. protects basic human rights and humane deportation. And how does this- Upon other things, it protects more than just human rights. And uh, that's something I'm saying. Well, we gave the examples in the case, and that, that's pretty much limited to that, but still uh, those are pretty significant. And that, you know- do not have to, uh, to learn uh, those illegal immigrants as a mother. Well, they do need to teach them in, in the convention Legal itself. immigrants, yes, but illegal, no. Well, illegal still have pathways that are illegal. Like, sure, that may not apply to illegal, but illegal have different pull factors. And we're saying that illegals have pull factors, and that's the bad part. This convention doesn't say that illegal immigrants are good and they are wrong. Well, yeah, no, they don't say that they're good, but they're saying that these immigrants, which normally didn't have these rights, which normally was a, a reason for these people not to try to do it illegally, instead try to do it legally, now there's a reason why they can do it legally instead, because it's sometimes a little bit harder to do it Thank legally. you. Do countries control their borders? Not well. I mean, the U.S. Yes. Spain is a very powerful country. Millions of migrants come in. Uh, so, if I want to go to U.S. legally, do I need to get a visa? Well, if you want to visit the U.S., yes. But uh, if you want to like actually migrate, and yeah, you need like a green card, that kind of stuff. So yeah. yeah so, if a uh, convention only protects uh, legal uh, immigrants, and you need to well, get a visa. Well, it doesn't only protect legal immigrants. It protects illegal as well. Like up to yeah, 35. Yeah, but we're talking about legal. So. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking 35 to 93. Right. So we're talking about the, the last half of the convention. Yeah. So if it protects legal immigrants and we control those who, uh, who come to the country, how will we have those flow? Well, just because we control who comes into the country, we're not like necessarily going to want them to have these like enumerated privileges, right? Because you're going to have a certain amount coming to the country, right? And the US is not gonna just be like, oh, well then no one can come to the country, right? Is that a good or bad thing? Because you said yourself that migrants should be coming to the country, so it's economically beneficial. But then you say, well, we can also, if that's bad, just decrease the amount by putting no, quotas, we're not, right? We're not uh, offering decreasing the amount. Right, but you, you agree that migrants coming in as it is right now. Right, so what we're saying is like, there are bad things when these migrants come. So then you're, you're basically saying, well, then they shouldn't come. But you said that they should come because they're economic benefits. So like, you're sort of just going back and forth and there's a little bit of a contradiction there. No, it's not, because we didn't say that. Okay, so well, I'm if, if a country can uh, control legal migration, and this convention also says that illegal immigration is a crime. How can a uh, country uh, put it, What the convention says is that illegal immigration should be deemed as a crime like best described by the nation itself. But it also says, but these illegal immigrants should be treated in a certain way that is oftentimes more you know, privileged than the normal way in which these countries treat them. Thank you. Do you know that the Do you know that convention is a flexible? And if, a, and if it, uh, 
And if it conflicts with domestic uh, laws, uh, the country can remove that law in order to... Uh, uh, to well, ratifying the convention is... Oh. Oh, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe the point you have, the point you have provided today, but in order to prove you that we should ratify the Foundation Convention, we have to prove you two things, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, we have to prove you that it is absolutely necessary to do so, and secondly, that it is beneficial. But first of all, let's look at the team opposition plan today. We see that the main two flaws of their plan was, first, the first flaw that they talked consistently throughout their speech about the increasing flows of immigrants. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we told you throughout our case that we are not going to leave open borders for every migrant from the country because we see that already right now legal migration is limited, it is, not, it is restricted, and, we, and the country actually regulates how many immigrants they allow in the country. And we said, and, and another flaw that they told us about illegal migration, ladies and gentlemen, we told you that illegal migration is actually a crime, and we, and we believe that it is another, we, we see that the country cannot, we, we cannot, we believe that the country can actually do something about when borders are restricted. And our second speaker told you about an example uh, of how the border control actually, uh, in, at, due, to, due to border control, actually the flows decrease. So going on to the first question, is it necessary? First of all, it's we told you from throughout our first speech that we actually have a moral obligation to do something. And we told you about that it, right now the Western countries are hypocritical when we actually contribute so much for the economy and, and these for these immigrants and we do not give them rights that they deserve. And another point that another point that they never responded was the mutual consent that the government gives to these migrants. Ladies and gentlemen, we told you that the uh, told you that the country, when it allows a legal migrant to come to the country, actually said it allows to be there. And when it contributes, we see it is a con we see it is absolutely a bad thing from the government when they do not allow when they do not allow us these certain rights that are so beneficial and that are a win-win situation for both countries that I'm going to expand later. But from right now, we see that uh, illegal migration. We told you that we're only going to give illegal migration uh, uh, only. Uh, 
We're only going to give illegal migration uh, to uh, illegal migrants, only deportation. Only the, we don't see any, 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 any link how it's going to actually increase flows of illegal migrants when we told you, that the, we told you about deportation. So this was a point where we was never uh, clearly, clearly, uh, clearly told. And we, we told you that we put double standards that is unfair. And really, if, we want, if we want to stand for our democratic societies, we, uh, we have to first, firstly act democratic. And that is why we proposed this convention to, to, uh, to make balance in the first place. And they told you about, and, and they told about it is unfair for the citizens. And that actually uh, takes me to the, our, my second point, is it beneficial? What they told about us, ladies and gentlemen, that the citizens are harmed. Ladies and gentlemen, we never, uh, first of all, we believe that this point is ac actually false. If we, if we prove you that the, flow, that the flows will not increase, and we told you about that, uh, we told you about border control because what they told about taxes, what they told about attentions, and what they told about uh, what they told about uh, unemployment, they told us, ladies and gentlemen, that that, that because of the flows, they actually gonna do these problems. But we told you that we're only gonna give these rights to immigrants that are right now in the country, and we will not put open borders for unrestricted flows of immigrants. And we told you, ladies and gentlemen, if we actually get social benefits if we give these rights, these uh, these rights. To, uh, to immigrants that are right now in the country. We, they, what they told about education, ladies and gentlemen, that they said that the children do not contribute in the, in the country. But we see it's actually a, a good point because they don't contribute right now, but we see that by giving them education, we have a future generation that are gonna be, uh, be high-skilled workers. Because what we see right now, uh, the only 30% of the immigrants right now have a high school education. I'm gonna expand this uh, during my brain drain. Point. But right now we see that they actually would be high, uh, would be high school workers that would benefit the country. And we see this very good for, for very good. And another point uh, we see that they never responded was integration, ladies and gentlemen. We told you that they will integrate in society and become a member of it. And this was a member control. They, and then and they will and what they told is going to be harmful because of the tensions, ladies and gentlemen. We told you two things. First of all, we told you that border controls is going to be controlled and there will be no bigger flows. And the second point, we told you about education. That education will lead them to integration in society. And when we told you about economic, that we actually get economic benefits when we give so these rights because, because the workers become more productive, because they know that they have stability in society, they know that their rights, uh, the, 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 their work rights are protected. And they have, even, because ladies and gentlemen, we told you in our first speech, their, their biggest motivation is money. They want to earn more money. So if they want to they earn more money, they have to work, uh, they will have to work productively. And we see that actually, this this right to worker unions actually allows the allows the immigrant to use its whole potential to uh, to work because their rights will be protected. Right now, and, we, and another point was told about team team negative was the conflict in domestic laws, and this is a harmful for the for the whole country. Ladies and gentlemen, we told you during the cross examination that this convention is not absolute; it can be flexible and it can adapt to countries, and that is why it is universal. That is why United Nations proposed in the first place. And another point was told by team negative today was about brain drain. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, our second speaker told you that that only low qualified. Uh, we see that we told you that. Only 30% of the immigrants have high school education. That means that the rest 70 are low qualified workers. And we see, and we see that the country, uh, the country is not that is not that harmed. Ladies and gentlemen, because we see we have a moral obligation to these citizens because of mutual consent and the hypocrisy we have right now, and because it will be beneficial for the country and for the immigrants, we beg to propose.
everybody ready? So first I want to thank um, the opposition for presenting their case and I'd like to thank the judges for um, presiding over this round. So um, first off, I'm going I'm to go through a couple main points in this speech. I'm going to start with what rights exist in both the affirmative and the negative world, and I'm going to show you why in this case it's necessary to negate to um, provide the sufficient rights, but also to make sure that resources aren't being extended over superfluous um, privileges. Then I'm going to tell you, uh, then I'm going to talk about the flow, whether or not more immigrants are going to be coming into the country, how, why more immigrants might be coming into the country, and what kind of impact this would have on the nation itself. Then I'm going to tell you um, about how even if the flow does not increase, we'll still be spending extra money by ratifying this treaty. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about a government's moral obligation, exactly who it has to protect, and whether or not it can infringe upon domestic law. So let's start with the first basic uh, argument here. Our first point is uh, what rights exist in the affirmative and the negative world. So in the negative world, let's remember, these immigrants are still being provided with basic human rights. We outlined for you in our previous two speeches that there are basic human rights outlined in several treaties, such as the UN Declaration on Human Rights, etc., and that many countries have actually cited this reason for the reason that they did not sign this treaty, that they feel that most basic human rights have already been outlined. Now let's look to the fact that in the affirmative world, yes, basic human rights are being, once again, protected by this by uh, this treaty. However, you are also providing them with these superfluous privileges. Now we gave you a couple of examples. The first one was uh, Article 45, which says that you have to teach the culture um, and language of a person, of a migrant, to them. Now we talked about how this is almost physically impossible. We also talked about reunification of the family and how this too, it may be a very difficult feat as the family may be, it may be a large family, it may be far away. This once again may cost resources. So the government doesn't have a moral obligation to provide these superfluous privileges. They do have a moral obligation to provide basic human rights, but that's already happening in the negative world. So this is the first reason to negate. The second reason to negate is the flow of immigrants. First of all, we're going to have an increase of illegal immigrants migrating. And as I showed you before, this, as my uh, partner showed you before, the second half, the first half of the treaty deals with illegal migrants. Now they tell you that uh, the go uh, a country only has an obligation to protect, um, a country only has an obligation to protect those people who come into its country legally. So essentially, if you affirm the resolution under them, you're not actually affirming because they don't even agree with the first part of the treaty, which protects illegal migrants. Now let's talk about why there will be more illegal migrants. Now that there are more rights provided to illegals, people who may have possibly decided to come through legally may see that it's much easier to come through illegally because it is less paperwork, etc., and that they're provided with many of the same rights. So you're going to have this increase in illegal migrants. This means more illegal, um, illegal migrants. Secondly, this reunification of the family will also mean more people coming into the country, more people to support with government resources, social welfare, etc., whatever the case may be. So now let's look at the third point to negate. The third reason to negate is that even if somehow the flow of migrants did not increase whatsoever, not one extra person came, which is very unlikely, we're still going to be forced to spend more money. Look at the superfluous privileges we outlined. It's going to cost a lot of money, as my partner pointed out, to find, let's say, a tutor who specializes in a specific indigenous language to teach that language and culture to, for example, one, uh, one person in one country. So that's going to cost a lot of money. Um, and then the last reason, main reason to negate is the moral obligation. What exactly is a government's moral obligation? Well, in cross-examination, we all agree that first and foremost, it is to that, that nation's citizen. And if you remember in the first cross-examination, we talked about how if we could prove to you that giving rights to these migrants, these superfluous privileges to these migrants is going to take away from the rights of citizens, then we need to negate. So um, first off, let's talk about the fact that the treaty conflicts with domestic law. Eight countries in the EU have, have cited this as the reason that they have not signed the treaty. So this is a true fact. It conflicts with domestic law. Secondly, they always have, they always have to put their citizens' economy, economic and social rights first. We told you that 40 to 50% of wage loss among low-skilled Americans is due to competition from immigrants and un immigrant unskilled workers. So this is another reason why it's infringing on the rights of migrants. Etc. Another thing that's important to keep in mind is that citizens do have to uh, pay dues to the government that migrants don't. For example, citizens can be drafted, migrants cannot. So citizens essentially give up some of their rights in return for protection from the government. So essentially what the negative is telling you here is that on a moral level, we're telling you that the government has no moral obligation to sign this treaty. We're already providing those basic human rights with the other treaties that have already been signed. 
On a more concrete note, we just showed you that there literally is not enough money to support these immigrants, even if the number of immigrants coming into the country, which does not increase, which is very unlikely. Um, 